Good morning, everybody. You can all hear me, right? I'm Brian Cartwright. I'm part of the Bio4 Climate team here, and I want to welcome you, uh, old friends and a lot of new friends. It's great to meet new people here, and uh, please come up and talk to us when you get a chance. We'd like to know you better and get you involved. Um, our next session is called Urban Soil. And uh, you can think of it in a lot of ways as a continuation of the theme of biodiversity because the soil we have in the cities too often, if, if it's even available or visible, it's more like dirt than soil. And, uh, and what's missing is the green plants, but also the biodiversity under the soil. And it's, uh, it's a topic we know we have known too little about, and we need to re-educate ourselves. And um, one, uh, one very good approach is uh, what our next speaker will talk about. Cover crops are a, a method that's developed with the no-till agriculture movement in, uh, in, in crop agriculture, but it makes a lot of sense to keep something growing all, all year long in your soil. So I'll let Tom Aiken tell us about that. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, thank you for coming today, taking your Sunday off to learn a little bit about soil. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, soil health and uh, the role cover crops can play in uh, building soil health. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, Scott has it wrong that uh, their four-step program isn't as good as our four-step program. Um, the USDA NRCS uh, has a, a a soil health promotion program going on right now where we're reaching out to farmers, um, trying to educate them on the importance of building soil health and uh, all the benefits that we can, that we can um, reap from that. Um, so I'm going to uh, drill down a little and show you what we do, can do here in the city. Um, I live here in West Roxbury, uh, or I live in, across the river in West Roxbury. Um, I have a community garden plot in Roslindale, um, primarily because I have so many trees on our yard that, you know, if I tried to grow a tomato plant, it would have to be on casters because I don't get enough sun to grow any, anything that's uh, remotely uh, an annual plant. But um, so the steps to uh, creating healthy soil are uh, just keeping the soil covered, um, trying to have a living root in the soil at all times. Um, minimizing the tillage or disturbance, so we want, want to eliminate our rototilling if at all possible, and then uh, just trying to increase the diversity of plants and how cover crops fit into that. So first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about soil organic matter and the different, different formats that we find in the soil. And if we think about it as a house, a food system, and the consumers, um, you can see here, if uh, out of all of our soil, only about 5% of our soil qualifies as organic matter. And out of that 5%, most of it is stable humus, which comes from uh, humic acids that, that develop over time as, as uh, uh, carbon is degraded. This is what we like to call uh, uh, the house. This is the part that uh, is essentially the, the home for everything else that is alive in the soil, all of the bacteria, the fungi, the, the macroinvertebrates. But arguably, the most important part is the food for those consumers living in the house. And that's the readily decomposable um, carbon that comes from um, root exudates and uh, just easily decomposed plant material. The soil food web <clears throat> is another uh, way of organizing this information. If we think about these different levels of consumers, um, we have our, our macroinvertebrates, uh, like birds and uh, earthworms, and then as we get smaller, we get down to the fungi and the bacteria, uh, and it ultimately comes from the carbon that is pumped into the soil through the process of photosynthesis. A lot of uh, soluble carbon 
is uh, from healthy root systems, is translocated from the foliage, pumped down into the, um, into the, into the soil, and you, know, you get these beautiful white root systems. For example, this is a, a picture from my community garden plot. Um, this is a cover crop of rye and hairy vetch that's currently growing. And you can see the root system is you know, like a full six to eight inches and just solid white roots. That's pumping an awful lot of carbon into the soil. And it's also feeding, you know, it's feeding the, the bacteria and the fungi we can't see, but it's the, the protozoans that are the food for the earthworms, the earthworms we can see. So when you see that nice dark colored rich soil, it's, it's, it's a sign of uh, a, a healthy soil that's full of carbon and uh, it's also holds together really well. It allows rainfall to infiltrate. Um, it prevents rainfall from running off. So for example, in a healthy soil, if you dump that, that really good stable aggregate into soil, it holds together. If there isn't any organic carbon holding that soil together, it just falls apart. And this is what's happening on a lot of our industrial agricultural land. Um, soils that have seen huge drops in soil organic matter have nothing left holding it together. So cover crops are uh, a, a wonderful way of reestablishing that, that, uh, that carbon. When we think of uh, cover crops, as Brian said, um, we think of it primarily uh, for large-scale agriculture, and it was first introduced as a soil erosion technique through our agency, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. This is a field of, of corn silage uh, on a dairy farm. The, the corn has been harvested. That, that corn will be fed to the, the dairy cows. The farmer has, has planted um, a, a crop of, of uh, winter rye. That will hold the soil in place, and it will also help uh, scavenge some excess nitrogen, um, as well as provide um, pride organic matter for the soil. Some of the other benefits, uh, cover crops can also suppress weeds. If they're uh, leguminous cover crops, such as uh, hairy vetch or clover, uh, it can contribute vast amounts of nitrogen for the following crop. Um, you can get anywhere from 80 to 120 pounds of nitrogen from a good crop of clover or uh, hairy vetch. And that's all the nitrogen that you need to grow vegetables or potatoes. So in my community garden plot, you know, I essentially don't have to use any fertilizer. I'm growing cover crops that are going to degrade and provide the nitrogen for my potatoes and my tomatoes and peppers, etc. And there are also cover crops that can be used as biofumigants. Uh, cover crops in the, in the um, mustard family have been shown to suppress nematode growth. So there are all kinds of wonderful uses for cover crops. And just as there are wonderful uses, there are also wonderful times of the year that you can plant these things. So you can plant them in the spring, you can plant them in the summer after a spring crop of vegetables, and you can plant them in the fall as a, as a traditional cover crop. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the earliest uh, plants that you can put in the ground are oats and peas. Um, I planted mine. Um, actually, the next slide is, this is what uh, oats and peas looks like after they've been established uh, for a while. But this was planted on April 10th in my garden. And you can see the roots have already penetrated about six inches down into the soil. Now I'll, I'll, uh, I'll use a fork and I'll just turn this over and I'll plant my, um, I'm not sure what's gonna go in there next. Maybe it'll be, a, uh, maybe cantaloupe will go in that plot. But the key is to always have that living plant growing or a living root growing and then you follow it with um, another crop. Uh, same, this is another slide from Cornell University that I stole. Uh, red, red clover is a wonderful winter and spring cover crop, provides a lot of nitrogen. Uh, crimson clover is another wonderful nitrogen uh, 
contributor. It's in the legume family. For summer cover crops, you can plant buckwheat. Um, it's a wonderful nectar plant. Bees love it. It also smothers weeds like it's nobody's business. Nothing can grow underneath a cover crop of buckwheat. Now, if you were trying to kill your front lawn, if you've got enough sun to do it, buckwheat would probably be a, a good plant to just drill into your lawn in, um, in July. You could just mow your, mow your grass really short, just take a, take a hoe and, and just make uh, tiny little seed slots and plant it with, with buckwheat and uh, you'll have dead grass in, in a couple of weeks. Kill your lawns. I can't convince my wife to let me do that yet. Um, Harry Vetch and uh, win winter rye is, is one of my favorites because it produces a huge amount of biomass, but also produces a lot of nitrogen. And um, one thing that we need to be careful about with with cover crops is that you have to know how to kill your cover crops uh, as well as grow them. Because if you let your cover crops get away, they can get lignified and the carbon can get woody and it's gonna end up tying up your nitrogen. So when we look at um, the decomposition rate is going to be faster when the carbon to nitrogen ratio is lower. So like um, manures are gonna have a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio rate. The ideal uh, biomass uh, microbial diet is 24 to 1 parts of carbon to nitrogen. And as you get up higher, as you wait longer to um, kill that winter rye cover crop, it gets woodier and harder to decompose by the, the biology in the soil. So the sooner we can kill it, the, the more nitrogen that's going to be available and um, the more cycling of carbon that we're going to have. So for example, this is a picture of what winter rye looks like when it gets too mature. You can see it's, it's starting to turn light green. Seed heads have formed. And what happens when you plant something into a cover crop that has got too much of a C to N ratio that's too high, it ends up tying up the nitrogen and you end up with reduced vigor of your plants. So you can see that the plants, the squash plants on this side of the field, which followed a clover cover crop, are doing much better than the plants that followed a very mature rye cover crop. So knowing how to kill a cover crop is just as important as knowing how to grow them. Um, and my last slide is, um, Think back to that guy, that annoying guy from Scotland who's got that, that, that Scott seed commercial that you see where he says, feed it. He, so he's, he's actually selling fertilizer. I'm selling cover crops and carbon. We need to feed them. We need to feed the biology of our soil. So thank you very much. <laughs>